If Texas attorney Sarah Weddington is experiencing flashbacks watching the debate over contraception, who can blame her? Weddington is the lawyer who successfully argued Roe versus Wade before the U.S. Supreme Court 39 years ago. It was a landmark decision making abortion legal. Sarah Weddington joins me in studio. Thank you for being here. It's my honor. So you help make history and fundamentally you changed women's rights in this country. When you see the debate going on right now in terms of contraception and women's rights, women's access to contraception, what are you thinking? Uh, I would never have thought 39, 40 years ago that that's where we'd be today. In fact, there was a U.S. Supreme Court case in 1965, Griswold versus Connecticut, where states had made the use of contraception illegal. And there was a woman who was a Planned Parenthood director in, in New Haven, Connecticut with her doctor who gave a contraceptive device to a married couple. They were arrested, prosecuted, and convicted of being accomplices to the use of a contraceptive device. And the U.S. Supreme Court said there is a right of privacy. And abort the a decision about using contraception is a private decision. And so I think people just assume that that is their right to make their decision. And it was that case I used as the springboard to Roe versus Wade. Now, Georgetown College student Sandra Fluke, she's become a spokesperson of sorts for women these days. She's the woman who was not able to appear before a um, congressional uh, meeting in terms of talking about contraception. Uh, she's also the woman who right-wing talk show host Rush Limbaugh called a slut. Uh, the president has since called her, but she has now become this spokesperson. Do you see a little bit of yourself in her when you see her sort of take on this big issue? Yes, in the sense that what they did to her was awful. And I think women everywhere saw this group of men sitting there getting ready to testify to Congress about contraception. Um, it, it, she should have been allowed to speak. She is a law school student. She is in her 20s or early 30s, 30 I think. Years old. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was every reason to let her. So I'm glad that uh, Rush Limbaugh's comments caused him to lose some sponsors that he has since sort of apologized, but not in any way that you really think, oh, he apologized. No. Uh, so I'm very glad that she is. Um, she is becoming a focus because she's also a symbol of the fact that women should be involved in this conversation. I want to take you back 39 years ago to that courtroom. I watched a short clip of you last night on YouTube. Um, as you entered the courtroom, you described in this interview that you had a flashback um, just before you were about to present your arguments to the Supreme Court. You had had an illegal abortion in Mexico and you said, quote, no woman should have to go through that and I would, do, I would do anything I could to see that that was not necessary. How important was it to you to win this case? Oh, uh, absolutely important uh, for a number of reasons. One is a lot of doctors in Texas had worked with me on getting ready for this uh, argument. And they, as medical interns and residents, had worked in our public hospitals with what they called the IOB wards, the infected obstetrics wards. And there were often women there who had done self-abortion, illegal abortion, who were about to lose their fertility, their lives, all kinds of problems. And so those medical students, then doctors, uh, were trying to save them. And they kept emphasizing how it was so important that we make abortion legal because otherwise women would have illegal abortion. And that's what when people say to me, what will happen if abortion becomes illegal? The clear answer is women will have illegal abortion. There now, go ahead. Th there have been several states that have passed laws that, that sort of restrict abortion. Do you, and, and there's some speculation that if the Supreme Court changes, it's sort of these states are anticipating that Roe v. Wade could be overturned. Is that, do you think that's possible? It's possible, but I don't think it'll happen right now because you look at who the members of the U.S. Supreme Court are and they don't have the votes they need to overturn Roe versus Wade. That's part of why who's the next president becomes so important because if one of the current judges were to leave the court, 
then it's up to the president to appoint someone to become a U.S. Supreme Court justice. And the vote is so close, that could really make the difference. So we're very concerned about who's going to be the new president. You look back in history, uh, and California was one of the places women could go for legal abortion. Uh, there was a flight that left Dallas Love Field every Thursday with women coming to California for abortion and returning that weekend. And it was Ronald Reagan who was the governor and signed that bill into law. So California and New York were the places that women could go. And so you, it's one of the reasons why California is so important because it was a place that women could come for good, safe, legal abortion. Why do you think this shift? It's been 39 years. Is it that do young women take, take for granted rights won by women like you? Or what? Why, why are we still having this debate? You know, I think to some extent it is that there are people who are in law school today that hadn't even been born when I was working on Roe versus Wade. It is history. And so I think they have come to accept that, yes, there's a, you know, a lot of public conversation, and yes, there are people who are totally opposed to my position, but surely it would always be legal to use contraception. Surely it would be uh, legal to have an abortion if you needed one. And so for me, part of the reason I'm traveling and speaking is to try to say to people younger than myself, and almost everybody is, um, we really need your help in terms of voting, in terms of being uh, active participants in the civil discourse to try to be sure that we say that that is your decision, not the government's. And so we are reaching out and trying to share with a younger group of women and men. I want to show um, it, it sort of the, the text of your opening argument to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, where you say, you open by saying, we are not here to advocate abortion. We do not ask this court to rule that abortion is good or desirable in any particular situation. We are here to advocate that the decision whether or not a particular woman will continue to carry or will terminate a pregnancy is a decision that should be made by that individual, that in fact she has a constitutional right to make that decision for herself. Has the debate really been confused with religion and morality rather than this fundamental constitutional right for women? Uh, I definitely think those who are opposed often take a more religious. Uh, when I spoke in South Carolina last week, I had a man who stood up and said, you know, the religious, and, and you often get people who say, but I don't, I believe this, I believe that. And what I'm trying to say is it's not your belief that should matter. It is that woman and her situation, her family, her ability to work and with and support her family that should be her decision. She knows it better than anybody. And it shouldn't be anybody else who makes that decision for her. In an odd twist to this story, I want to talk a little bit about the woman in this case, in this landmark case, Roe, dubbed Roe. Her actual name is Norma McCorphy. Again, last night I'm watching a video of her <laughs> doing an interview. She was very pro-choice for a number of years and then a few years ago became an evangelical Christian and now um, is with a group that, that fights against choice. And um, she says in this, this interview, she says, there's really never a day that goes by that we don't think of how we can overturn Roe versus Wade. What do you think when you hear her say that, knowing what you know about her back from 39 years ago? Well, first, I think it's an honest statement that she spends a lot of time and effort working with people who want to overturn the decision. But when she was in a situation where she was pregnant and she didn't want to be, she wanted it to be legal for her to have an abortion. You see, I think, again, it's not up to her to say to somebody else what it should be. Um, and so she obviously has the right to make her own decision. For 25 years, she was pro-choice. In recent years, she's been anti, but that's not the question. And the case was not for one person. It was a class action. So it was for all women who were or might become pregnant and want the option of abortion. And I still think that all women should have that ability to decide to have an abortion, to decide not to have an abortion, to decide to put a pregnancy once there's a birth up for adoption. That should be her decision. Sarah Weddington, we don't have a lot of time left, but what would you want to tell young women today? Well, first I would say that it is 
you look back as I was growing up, and there were so many limits on what women could do. Women couldn't even run full court in basketball. We got half court and two dribbles. We didn't get credit unless our fathers or our husbands signed for us. Now most people get a credit card offer every week. We didn't get to make decisions about our own reproductive. Uh, we didn't get to go to law school. I was in the first group of women who went to law school. We didn't get equal pay. And so what we've been doing all these years is trying to push back barriers so that women could make more decisions. On May the 3rd, Cecile Richards will be here, who is the president of Planned Parenthood for their annual dinner. And I think the things that she says and does are so important. She's a very good spokesperson. Uh, so what I would want to say to them is don't let them take this right away. It's your, it should be your decision, but only if you fight to save it will it be kept. Sarah Weddington, thank you for being here. My honor.